Mother Earth goes in time or so I'm not. No, everybody's on. Oh, that. okay. Yeah, I got you. He did my test one, so that's okay. Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to SRV6 BOF on your last day of ITF 119. The note will continue to apply, pay special attention to any IPR that you might hold or uh, as well as the code of conduct that we agree to when we register to this ITF meeting. Various links are provided on this page. You should have read them and be well aware of them. If you have a questions, you could reach out to chairs and le leadership as well as other participants in the working group who will be able to guide you. But please pay attention to note well, you have already agreed to this by being in this room, both virtually as well as in person. Uh, both discussions can get heated, uh, but please pay attention that we are a professional organization. We have specific ITF guidelines for code of conduct. There is procedures in place for anti-harassment. And if you feel that you need support in any of these areas, there are specific guidelines laid out to you. Uh, please, if you have questions, please reach out to us and we will be able to help you and guide you uh, on this. But this is not acceptable in our organization. So please pay specific attention to this. Uh, these tips, uh, especially for folks who are uh, joining us new, uh, we do all our work on Meteco. Remote participants are already on it. For local participants, please join the Meet Echo Lite client. We will use that as a mic queue uh, in which both on-site and, uh, and uh, offline, uh, on-site and remote participants will join together. Uh, do not send your audio and video directly. Join the queue and on chairs uh, indication, then only uh, uh, open the audio channel and video channel. Please pay specific attention to this. We want our meeting to run smoothly. Uh, we have a minute taker. Is that right? Who have we asked for minutes? Minutes, minutes, minutes? Shisong? Yes, thank you. And other folks as well, because uh, there would be a lot of time for discussions. Please make sure that the notes is capturing your points clearly. And it's a collaborative note taking. So please help us uh, in so that we can capture the discussion well today. And uh, as these things are already mentioned, please do state your name clearly, though it shows up, but it's always good uh, for record keeping that your name is recorded. Be mindful of the agenda time. And of course, we have a meet echo slash Zulip chat going. You can have uh, some side discussions there as well. But the key points that you want to be recorded in the minutes, please come to the mic and state it there. This is our agenda. Uh, we have an hour of operator presentations from various different operators who would like to uh, describe uh, what they are doing in SRV6 operation space, what are the issues they are facing, et cetera, and what kind of discussion they hope this potential working group could have. We will follow this with a charter discussion. Since this is a working group forming BOF, uh, we need to decide whether we have support for the charter as the proponents have put forward and we will follow it with both questions. Is there any agenda bash? I see no one running to the mic, so we'll move on. Uh, just a reminder of our BOF goals. 
uh, as per our ITF policies, uh, the BOF's main aim is to demonstrate that there is support in the community, that there is a problem that is worth solving. There are enough participants in the room who will work on the problem, whether the scope of the problem is clear and whether there is enough reasonable probability of having success in this room. The key thing, especially for an SRV6 ops buff, we could we would focus on the charter and the scope is clear, our deliverables are clear, clear and whether we have a critical mass of operators, contributors and reviewers in the room for this work to be potentially be successful. And with that, we will start with operators pres uh, presentations. Okay, thank you, Duru. So next step, uh, we have invited five uh, experts from different uh, operators uh, around the world. Uh, they will discuss their uh, challenge requirements, best practices, and uh, expectations uh, in SRV6 operations from a different uh, uh, perspective. The first uh, uh, speaker is Zutan uh, from uh, uh, MTN. Uh, uh, he will share their experience of building a wireless backhaul network using SF6. Welcome, Zutan. Could you hear us? I can hear you. Welcome, guys. Uh, Zoltan, I've also passed you uh, the slide <clears throat> control. So you should. Ah, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Firstly, good morning. Um, it's 1.36 in the morning here. So initially, when um, when I saw the time, I thought there was a mistake, and then I said to to the local I said to the local team, let me let me do an online, let me do a recording and share that. And then they said, no 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 no, we want you uh, we want you live. So um, you got me live. I don't know about fresh, but we're going to give it a shot anyway. Um, but good to be here. So I think I asked to be first up, uh, obviously because of the timing. Um, but I thought it's quite important to share with you some of the operational challenges we see and what and we're facing in the network. So this slide pack is really aimed at, 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 at those elements. Uh, just, just to explain, we MT in South Africa, an incumbent mobile operator. Um, we operate on various, in various markets um, on the continent. Um, but today I'm specifically referring to or talking about MT in South Africa's experience. Let the slide update. There we go. Okay, so this slide pack is going to go through and mention three challenges um, in particular. I'll just start with, with 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 explaining some of them. So some of you might be aware um, the grid availability is 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 been declining year on year in South Africa. What that results in is that when there's an unstable grid, power goes down in a particular area, and um, nodes become unavailable. Now, every single site that we have has been deployed with batteries on site. Unfortunately, through theft and vandalism, those sites get compromised. So what we started last year um, was, a, was a dedicated resilience program. Uh, we basically rolled out across three quarters of our sites um, new um, battery autonomy uh, to increase the, the power of, uh, let me say, the availability, the network availability of the nodes in the network. However, there's still going to be sites that fail, and I think that's that that's created a you know um, um, a concern, but also the opportunity to deploy some of these advanced features to help us in terms of rerouting and finding the best the best path throughout the network. So the first element is unstable connectivity, either through the power availability challenges or through fiber cuts. Fiber cuts are a reality. Sometimes the fiber cuts are not necessarily um, uh, you know, a lot of them are not intentional. They're through ex excavations, um, you know, roadworks. And in other cases, we had some mudslides that, that remove um, whole um, tracts of land. And then you have fiber and ducting that's, that's been um, cut. So that, that creates a bigger problem. So the first one is an unstable connectivity environment due to, the, to, to those factors. The second one is link congestion. Link congestion is a real factor. Since COVID, we've been fortunate. Our traffic growth in the mobile network has grown between 35 to 40 percent. So, you know, it's been good traffic growth in the mobile network. Unfortunately, that growth also then leads to uh, massive uh, upgrade programs to upgrade, you know, link capacity. 
Now that link capacity is, is it, if it was just on fiber, it would be a lot easier. But a lot of these uh, sites, especially as you start going into the rural areas, those sites are, are on microwave systems. Those microwaves are, you know, in cases, multi-hop systems. Um, so you have to upgrade different, you know, uh, links on the path. And you'll also appreciate, and we've got some slides on that, you know, when there are failures and that rerouting, then obviously these, 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 uh, you know, some of these key links uh, congest and you have to, you know, we have to manage that. The, the third portion is the, the, when you, when you deploy outside a, an environment, like an urban environment into rural environments, you often don't have the luxury of, um, of, of simplifying the network. And you've got these large ring or mesh topologies that result, and they're quite complex to manage. And we've got some pictures later on, diagrams to show that. But it becomes quite difficult to visualize the nodes, the links, the packet loss rates, and the latency in these, these networks. So the visual representation of that is quite important, and we'll explain why in a second. So these are the three challenges that we'll go through. Let it update. Okay, so the first one is in terms of link congestion. So we, we picked an area here just to give a view of, of what we were describing. So on top, you've got the, the mobile base station, the radio access network. It's connected through an access uh, ring in this case onto a second access ring that goes to an aggregation network that then hands off into the core network. What we've done also here is just to highlight the areas that have fiber and microwave, um, maybe not so clear on the slides, but if you have the, the PDFs, you can, you'll be able to see that the, the the, the paths and the routes. So it's a mix of microwave and and um, and fiber systems. But on this particular diagram, what's quite important, and that's what, what we um, show in here, was that you know there's two incidents over here where the the, the link utilization went beyond the, the the thresholds. So you'll understand that over here that this base station has got a particular path to the network. There was a particular utilization um, uh, uh, increase beyond beyond the threshold. Intervention was made, and then shortly after that. Again, it hit those thresholds, and then another intervention was made. And what we're demonstrating is obviously then the path is a there's an optimal path that's been that's been chosen back to the network. So this is vital. And, and this happens because, like I said, depending on the time of day, you get the busy hour in the early evening, some industrial areas, the busy hours in the early earlier part of the day. Depending on when that busy hour is and that, and that um, traffic requirement, you know, the, the congestion on link will change. And obviously the, the the key thing here is that we're using the link congestion um, use case to basically find the optimal path back to the, to the network. If we take that one step further, let's go to the next slide. In the next slide, what we find was that sometimes the load balancing is not optimal. So we wanted we wanted the the ability to provide a multi path um, scenario so we could use so we could balance. Sometimes the algorithms choose a particular path that that add to your congestion woes. So two things happened in, in an area of uh, South Africa called KwaZulu-Natal. We did a proof of concept um, where we deployed um, SRV6 in, in this particular region. And on the left hand side, what we're showing is two elements. The one was the packet loss rate improvement. So before the packet loss rate is shown over there, and we had 38% of the sites that had a, a, a packet loss rate greater than 10 to the minus three. And that improved after we deployed um, SRV6 uh, to, to um, to a 12% of the network having a packet loss rate greater than 10 to the minus three. I think the key thing here is that the, if you look at the, the, the graph, showing the link utilization, and really what we found was that there was a massive decline in the highly congested links. And it was more balanced across all the links in that particular area. So if you look at the picture, you'll see the little dots represent obviously the, the, the nodes in the network, the routers, the cell site routers. And what you have is you have a reduction in obviously packet loss rate, but also you have a balanced um, traffic profile. So that was due to basically um, balancing the traffic across multi paths throughout the network. So that was a key a key component. And we really want to scale this out to other parts of the network um, because the trial was so successful. If we go to the next slide. In this particular slide, we're showing load balancing um, uh, throughout the network, but specifically due to failures in the network. So before I was just indicating the nature of the network, and you'll appreciate that you, what, when you have people think a network goes down and then it's all down, and then an environment needs to compute uh, the, 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 the optimal path, and then that path is then applied. But you'll appreciate it, similar to a movie, 
where you see a whole area of power going down and the grid goes down systematically. This is what happens in these areas. The grid doesn't go down all at once. You have areas that go down and then you also have battery systems that are there. Maybe the battery autonomy de depletes and then a site goes down. So that happens at different phases. Now you need to have an intelligent system that can be able to react quick enough to these changes. So what we're showing here is basically this particular example was a site feeding back to the core network. You'll see it's, it's got, again, the mixture of fiber and, and microwave systems. And it's quite comprehensive in the beginning. And then you start seeing this, this gradual decay of the connectivity. So you have the connectivity, the first one going down at, at, a, at a time of at, at 104. And then the next one is at 106.45. And the next one is at 106.56. And what's quite important there, you can, you can get an appreciation. That's happening either minutes or seconds after another event. So the tools are basically having to recompute very quickly in terms of finding that optimal path. And then ultimately, we didn't show another step over here, but ultimately the last recovery is that the recovery of all of this is three hours later. So at, at, at um, 1,514 hours. And then you have the optimal you know, um, routing again. But what you'll notice in this, in this example is you have then, you know, instead of having two paths to your network, you've only, only got one path. For this particular site back to the network and that's just based on the on the um on the nature of these nodes going down so like i said what we've done since then we have done a lot of work to increase the battery autonomy on a lot of these sites so this example was from last year late last year but since then things have been improved quite a bit so we're still using a lot of the features around the pce the optimal path um, and the load balancing of traffic but specifically this example showed some of those extreme cases where you do have a number of sites going down I've only got 49 seconds left, so I'll quickly go through the GIS map. Um, the visualization of your network is critical. Um, and what I was explaining to, to, to different teams, it's not just important for the, for the transmission team. It's also important for our resilience teams and our managed services teams that are responding in these areas. So that's a critical factor. So there's multiple domains that can benefit from this visualization. So on this map over here, I mean, basically they're showing on the right hand side the, the, the packet loss rate. And the visualization of that is quite nice. The, high, the red is the, high, the, the higher levels of packet loss. On the left-hand side, what's quite nice is you can always then generate a view which shows the status, <clears throat> the bandwidth, the delay, the packet loss rate, other sort of factors. And last but not least, at the bottom, you'll see IFIT. IFIT really helps you to understand the hop-by-hop -hop, you know, the hop -by -hop, hop performance of the network and detecting some of those key um, areas where you need to have interventions. So I think in this particular one over here is that there's two messages we wanted to, you know, you know, firstly say. The first one is there's a massive benefit for your operational teams, but there's also a massive benefit for the managed services teams that respond to these to these areas. I think the other benefit is then from a planning perspective. You can use these to add some planning insights. And that's where we've been using this for the resilience program. So looking at areas where nodes have been going down, specifically aggregation nodes, hub sites that need to be focused on. We call them H1 and H2 sites. We've categorized them into two priorities, and that's been a real benefit by having this visualization. So, last but, so my last slide is just saying to, to wrap it up, uh, you know, for, for the team, um, just to say, you know, thank you for creating this, uh, I think, forum. Um, it's always good to see operator, you know, use cases and, and, and some of the challenges they're experiencing. Um, we really support the end-to-end -end, uh, SRV6 unified uh, standard that's been presented and, and been discussed. I think from our perspective, you know, the, the enhancement and, and some of the network visualization elements are quite interesting for us. Like I said, they, they apply, they can be used not just in operational domains, but also in, in many service and, and in planning domains, which is quite important. So sorry I went over the time, but thank you very much for allowing us to present some use cases in our network. Thanks, Zoltan. Just a reminder, we will uh, currently do only clarifying questions and we have enough time for broader Questions. So please take your clarifying questions quickly. And we have Warren. So two things. First off, can everybody in the room please make sure you've signed in to meet Echo just so you know we have a count. And then the owner is just a comment. As somebody is born in South Africa, thank you very much for showing this. You know, it's nice to see how how the network's changing. I was born in Marisburg. Ah, that's great. So that area was KwaZulu Natal, which is which is the area you're mentioning. But in and in the pictures, you'll notice some of them are north towards Richards Bay, which is a mixture of urban and in rural. But yeah, welcome and, and great to hear. Yeah. Uh, any other question? 
clarify the question. See now. So uh, next uh, present is uh, Daniel from uh, Bell Canada. Daniel, could you hear, hear us? Uh, yes. Uh, should I share my own or? Okay, have... I know how it works now. Yeah, you should have slides. That's fine. Yeah. yeah. Just going to move this. Differently. So thank you guys uh, and good evening, good morning. Um, today I'm going to entertain you with our um, addressing plan and how we deploy that. Uh, it's um, the deck usually is fairly uh, longer than this one. Uh, we use it to train ops, but today inside 10 minutes, I'm only here to uh, give you the gist of how we did that. And uh, obviously you can uh, contact me if, you, if I pique your interest enough to uh, follow our track. Um, while we are, um, our motivation and the first thing that we did when we uh, started to be real with the SAW V6 deployment back in 2020 uh, was to uh, uh, think about how we're going to deploy the IP addressing plan. Uh, back then we uh, we used to call it USID, now it's CSID, and I apologize already if I mentioned USID a couple of times, it's just that uh, it's been so long with that term. Um, so with, uh, with CISA, the first uh, thing was to make sure that this was uh, unique uh, across the backbone, that we had enough scale to address all the nodes and all the, uh, the different islands that we, uh, that we have. We call an island like a metro network or a pocket of network attached to the backbone. Um, the very first thing we were asking ourselves is how can we be efficient uh, deploying this? So we came up with a meta that is very much mathematical and uh, we uh, ended up coding this to make it very easy for our uh, operation people uh, so they don't need to know uh, behind the scene all the maths and everything uh, the tool will uh, generate the usage the locators attached to it also the uh, the summary address for all the uh, the abr the uh, the border of every island and that was our, our goal. And today, just going to go over the methodology of this. Um, so I can quickly skip, but very uh, briefly, uh, if I'm not able to stay inside 10 minutes, I'm hoping you can take over the deck and maybe uh, come back with some uh, few uh, question or uh, comment. But basically, I'm going to just do a couple review of the uh, CSID and the, the allocator just to make sure that we're on the same page because that becomes the base as I move into the slides. So back then, uh, after the 216, the format, the 22 bits uh, lock and 16 bits is the, the, the CSID uh, was the standard and we standardized on it uh, on this um, uh, at Bell. Um, the L stands for the length of the mask. And you can see at the bottom uh, an idea of every USID or CSID, sorry, inside the container that follows the nodes on the, on the right, uh, the picture that you see there. Um, obviously, if you guys remember, and I'm, I'm hoping so, that there's about six CSID per container when we use 3216. That hasn't changed in our deployment. Uh, in here, I just want to point out a few things. First, in our lab, we use FCC. But in our protection network, we use FD, which is our which are ULA. So at our last ITF in Prague, I was explaining the security aspect of why we went uh, ULA. But here, I can almost also say that uh, it's because we have more bit to encode more uh, function uh, in the address. Uh, from a security, you just keep everything opaque and, and we're not leaking outside of our domain. Uh, this is the our assumption from a network design perspective on how we're going to address this. So on top, um, you see the uh, number of uh, flex algo we were thinking, and we still uh, think right now, no more than four. Uh, our trick uh, design here can allocate for more than four, but and we're actually using three. Uh, we were just. Uh, uh, using for at the design perspective, and I think industry-wise, we're just uh, curious to see what other use case we can do with Fexalgo. So that's the first point. 
The second point, or the third point, actually, in the slide, uh, we wanted to cover at least 128 area or ISIS domain. Uh, that's a maximum in theory value. Uh, we don't think we're going to go over 99. Uh, we wanted to make sure we could cover up to seven large area. A large area will have up, could have up to 1,025 nodes. Our backbone level two area zero, 512, but that's a, a theoretical limit. So we know our algorithm actually scale. We don't really have more than 100 and something a node in our backbone, area zero. So here, we could use this a little bit as uh, what's coming in the next slides. So in green, that's how we decided to encode the flex algo first. So those are the, the last two nibbles of the second group where you see GG. Um, the SRV6 site ID and uh, the ISIS level, uh, so I think I'm going to cover another slide. Uh, it's because we were a bit brownfield. So we already deployed ISS uh, level in areas, and it wasn't really matching because we were random when we deployed ISS a long time ago. So to match the algorithm in, in our map, we ended up doing a mapping, which is also embedded in our code, um, which will be the first two nibble of the, the third group. And then the node ID, the last two nibble of, of the third group. And all that makes it uh, unique across our backbone. So in here, uh, FlexAlgo, that's something typic typical for whoever has deployed FlexAlgo. Uh, we have uh, 00 for loc uh, locator 0 and, and 01 for low latency and 199 for bandwidth and restriction. Uh, link restriction. So that's the first thing that we had to think about before going into the, the CSED. In this case here, we're mapping, I'm starting to talk about the mapping between uh, SRV6 site ID. As I said, it's uh, the equivalent of the ISS area that we've, uh, we've mapped plus the node ID to make it unique. We came up with what we call sets. Uh, the, that which is uh, are the first two nibble of the C set. A set will have a maximum of 256 uh, possibilities. If we lock them, then it means if we fix them, that means they are uh, unique uh, across the the backbone. That we we have. If I move a little bit, uh, the Gib and the Lib. I'm very certain everybody is familiar with that. A global SID, uh, local SID for services. Um, if I move here, um, okay. So a set will have up to uh, 256, like I, I mentioned. If we just look at the GIB, that's 224 possibilities from an hexadecimal perspective, uh, which is everything between zero and D, as you can see in the second line. Uh, the, the lib is only 32 set, and it's uh, for E to F. So we know right away if it starts by E all the way to F, that would be lib, which means when we calculate all that, it gives 57,000 possibility for the nodes and 8,000 for the lib, for, uh, which is actually described in, in some draft. So that's not new. What's new in here is the way we're going to encode it and which digit in the hexadecimal we're going to be using to make it uh, unique. So here, if we're mapping the ISIS and the site ID, and we have a concept of a small area or a medium area or a large area, a small could have only one set. So a small for us would be uh, less than 256. As soon as we are 255 uh, or more, that's a medium area, less than 512. So a medium, we will allocate two sets. And later, I'm going to cover uh, the large area will be, we will be allocated the four sets. So which means, and we will end up summarizing. For the ISIS level uh, two area, the backbone, we decided to chop it to slash 32. That's what we will inject in the island as a, a pseudo default route, a default gateway, or default route, uh, I mean. Uh, 
to force from a security and policy that uh, only that range will be allocated uh, inside the, the, the island. So if something happened, like somebody dropped their filters and they end up having the whole internet or a, a rogue nodes, uh, if it outside of that range, uh, the slash to do two, it won't cross any island. Here you have a little picture of uh, an area uh, one uh, with say uh, ISS 71 area one with one set. So the set ID one is mapped with one set. In this case, it's two. Um, if I move to give you a greater example, so on the left side, you see the ISS 72, say it's 300 nodes. In this case, that's two set. But like I said, we, uh, we we, we round it up to a slash 32 for all locators or all flex uh, In the island, um, uh, for 100 uh, a node, that a small one, we allocate one set, the medium two sets, and then we keep incrementing when it's a large for four sets. And, and we, we, we uh, convert the decimal into hexadecimal. That's what you see uh, where you see DC for. Uh, uh, the uh, the large uh, the large one in hexadecimal. So as we were going into this journey, we also realized that if you have, let's say, a node that is only IPv6 with no v4, then how you uh, we used to put the loop back for the net ID inside the ISR. So in our case, we decided to use the SR, this is the locator zero, to fill up instead of the v4 loop back. And for BGP router ID, which is a, a 32 uh, a field uh, digit, well, you can see the nomenclature here. We have uh, the digit six for IPv6, uh, zero for constant. Then we use the set that I was talking about plus the two node for the BGP router ID that also needs to be unique inside the backbone. For the loopback on top, uh, because we have the, the, the C set that is unique, then we uh, use the constant column, column one slash 20, 128 for, uh, for every loop back. Now as a summary, uh, and what I'd like you to, uh, as a takeaway, it's very important to plan the, uh, the IP addressing for the network architecture because we're gonna live with that for a long, long time, especially with V6. I think by 20 years by now, it's still gonna be in place in, in, in I hope so in most design. Um, and from a deployment scenario, from the scope of the charter, while it's all about the challenges around the, address, um, the IP address um, um, deployment and the guidance for operation to better use at scale the, uh, the usage. Thank you. Um, done. Any questions or comments? Is there? Clarification questions? See none? Okay, thank you, Daniel. So next presentation is from uh, Thomas uh, Swisscom. Yeah, please, Thomas. Hi, everybody. So uh, my take is uh, on network observability at Swisscom, uh, specifically to SRV6. Um, this is usually a slide I'm, I'm showing just to raise awareness that uh, we, we still have challenges uh, when changes, operational configurational changes are happening in an operator network. The impact, because society is more and more depending on internet connectivity. The remote folks are not hearing you clearly, so closer to the mic, please. Okay, sorry, and let me try this. So. Uh, so the impact and duration uh, of network incidents are uh, still very large and uh, probably due to net uh, deficiencies in network visibility, uh, the, the, the issues cannot be detected quick enough. So Swisscom did a de deliberate choice uh, when moving from MPLS segment routing towards SRV6, we wanted to have data plane visibility. And this is just to highlight a little bit the history we have with uh, network analytics. So we started around 2015. We went over onboarding as many platforms or as, as many network nodes as possible. Uh, got engaged at ITF because we saw network telemetry still in its infancy. 
And now we have approximately 30,000 nodes uh, delivering metrics and approximately 35 million metrics per second. And every day about 500 users, depending on what kind of role they have accessing the data. We have experience in um, data plane visibility on MPLS SR since 2021 and on SRV6 since last year, uh, since last August. So our first, let's say, uh, input uh, or contribution to the IDF community was to bring uh, visibility into the data plane. Small change was needed on the, let's say, MPLS uh, data plane side in IPFIX, which led into the RFC 9160, so that we can see clearly from which network protocol the labels were associated. While with RFC 9487 last year, uh, we have now also all the SRV6 network dimensions covered in IPFIX, and we have uh, quite a few major vendors who already implemented that, that RFC. Last but not least, and I will go more into detail in the next slides, uh, we want to go into on pass delay measurement because delay and loss is very much a concern. Here, just uh, to show some of the SRV6 extension, which role they have from a packet capture perspective. Here, to show a little bit from a, a let's say, connectivity service uh, perspective. So we have VPN endpoints in VRFs. We have logical connection, VPNs connecting them. And basically on each node, PE and P nodes, we are uh, exporting forwarding plane, control plane, and management plane information um, and correlate them in near real time. So for the uh, on pass aspect, and I think that's very much key uh, for uh, for segment routing because you can steering the, 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 the forwarding pass from its source. Uh, we also want to have visibility uh, on the forwarding pass itself, but also uh, where the delay is being accumulated in the network. And we look first from a use case perspective, what is important to us? So first of all, uh, since we are uh, having SLAs with customers on how much loss and delay we can have on which QS class in our network, our first objective is we want to get visibility on delay and loss on customer packets. So basically it's a, a passive measured uh, on pass delay uh, for uh, hybrid type one. Second is, uh, the customer packets are just following the active path. So we want to also be able to probe, uh, test the backup path. So in case we are doing uh, maintenance work and failover, we want to understand what's the current uh, delay and loss characteristic. And when we are failovering to the passive path, whatever we are still in that boundary or, or not, it should be applicable to the IPv6 data plane for sure. Uh, very much important is if you are measuring uh, delay and loss uh, uh, for uh, customer packets, uh, we also want provider network dimensions. So we want to understand which network dimension. So that can be a next hop, can be a SIT, can be a SIT list or an MPLS label. We want to understand uh, which of those network dimension is causing how much delay. And since uh, data plane metrics are uh, quite a lot to be exported. Uh, data aggregation is very much key. So we leverage a two-level aggregation scheme on the network node and also on the data collection side. Now, at the end, uh, compared to the previous picture I showed, uh, basically the selection process of the packet is slightly changing. So before, Basically, on each and every node, uh, we were sampling the packets. So now uh, our aim is to only sample once. That's ingress when the packet is entering the, the segment routing domain. And that criteria, which packet at which granularity should follow, follow the, uh, the quality of service concept we have. So packets which are going into the priority queue, uh, of, uh, of course, we want to see it more granular. We, we care more about those. 
uh, packets which are going to the best effort queue. Uh, here we want to just have sampling and maybe a more coarse view on the network itself. So once the packet is selected, it's going to be marked with a direct export bit. And then on the following subsequent uh, node in the forwarding pass, we no longer sample. We are just matching on this direct export bit and then basically exporting the packet again. So from a comparison point of view, uh, basically the only thing changing is uh, before we were sampling on every node. So therefore we were not able to follow for each and every single packet the forwarding part. Now we are able to do so. Now, optionally, since we our aim is actually to measure on pass delay, uh, we also add a timestamp on the very first node uh, when we are forwarding the packet. And then on the subsequent node, we are measuring the delay. So comparing the, the arrival time of the packet and originally when the packet was entering the, the, the segment routing domain. And with that, the only thing we are actually adding as information at the export is the delay measurement besides the packet and the byte count we already have. So therefore, the overhead is relatively small. Uh, so we have a very efficient way of uh, enriching the data with delay. Now, uh, if we look at ITF, the different possibilities we have to uh, actually measure uh, delay and loss on the network, and if you're looking on the, the features uh, possibly we can have, and on Yellowman, I just marked what's the Swisscom interest. We see that basically there are currently two technologies uh, which are fulfilling our requirements. And with that, uh, so st on the status side from network telemetry, so we have it BMP, uh, address family agnostic protocol. So there were no changes needed for SRV6. Uh, on the data plane side, uh, we have it RFC 90, 9487. Now also visibility into the data plane. With uh, IPFIX on pass telemetry, we are also now having uh, or going to have uh, delay and delay characteristics. And uh, we have two pot protocols uh where this can be up, uh, applied which is iom and alternate marking so from uh, the charter perspective uh the focus uh, uh basically our contribution is mainly on the uh, network management parts on the observability assurance and performance optimization and here i think we can give uh, guidelines and also implementation uh, guidelines, uh, how to implement network telemetry specifically for SRV6 in the network. So that when traffic is being steered at the, at the source, we can actually verify that with uh, network telemetry correctly. That's it from my side. Okay. Any questions? See now. So thank you, Tomas. Sure. Okay, next uh, present uh, is Lin Jian Sung from uh, uh, Alibaba. Uh, Lin Jian, could you hear me? Yes. Okay. So yes, so you I will help me to play the slides. Uh, I have given you slide control. You should be yeah. able to move it. Uh, I will try it. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, it works. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Lin Jie Sung and I'm from Networking Infrastructure Team at uh, Alibaba Cloud. Today I will share the practice status and uh, uh, the status of SRV6 in Alibaba Cloud. Uh, firstly, I would like to give a background and, and uh, why we use the IPv6 and the SRV6 in, the, in our, our uh, network. As you know, uh, with the emerging AI and um, our new workload, data center network is evolving rapidly. A large scale, the high performance network becomes crucial to support a large scale AI cluster. Uh, there is, uh, 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 the, we, we build uh, Alibaba predict, uh, predictable network uh, in, 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 in the cloud. And uh, here I just have, want to highlight that we utilize a single protocol stack uh, V6 and SRV6 and a chip, a single chip white box that can help us to 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 uh, to make the DevOps 
for the network feasible and programmable control plan and data plan. And the motivation is, uh, uh, is clear that uh, in the DC network, the switch is simple, but the DCI network route is more complicated. Besides IPv4, there are a lot of latency protocols, as you know, the MPS, traffic engineering, VPN, etc. Our idea is to simplify the protocol and network first. We simplify and convert all the protocol to IPv6 only and use SRV6, V6 provides the network of functions. So the simplicity is, is the, uh, the most important motivation behind. And now this in the distributed net, uh, cloud computing network, there are millions of servers located in tens of thousands of locations or even more edge locations. The scale of cross domain traffic engineering is much larger than the times of central cloud computing network. So uh, the another reason to use segment routing IPv6 is to provide fine grained uh, traffic service SLA uh, dynamic service requirement to fit in the diverse customers. So the SRV6 uh, is our strategy to, the, uh, to, to involve the network. And right now, uh, we, <coughs> we just built a newly built, there is a newly built uh, DCI network called ECO that employs an IPv6 on the line with SR and SRV6 traffic engineering. It consists of multiple physical plan and feature, features two distinct edge types. The peer edge uh, are utilized for SP peering, are implemented using the EPF approach, where the DC edge, the DC edge is employed to connect data centers with the DCI and established through Sonic and commercial pizza box. The overlay the network utilized the SRV6 VPN and then utilize a simple SRV6 policy to efficiently distribute traffic across the various uh, physical uh, plans. Uh, there are several aspects on uh, the SRV6 operation Alibaba. Uh, the first one is address planning. Uh, I think uh, uh, different operators had their demand to encode how to encode the seed. But you know, uh, I just want to highlight here is that we designed the address, the, the, the seed to accommodate the use of SRV6 UC policy across our multiple AS domains. Uh, and the configuration of seed is not distributed through the extended protocol. Instead, it's all configured on the devices through uh, system settings as our planned. And uh, we, uh, the DevOps is a, a, is a, a unique uh, uh, features uh, in our operation because we use, we deployed the white box in hundreds of routers. Uh, we simplified the network and reduced complexities on demand. For example, we only use BTP, there's no IGP. And we use different routers, for example, the ESR for the, to carry the cap capability of SRVPN and the EARs for uh, the SRV6T, et cetera. And we also face, face the, the visibility, uh, the, the, the challenges uh, for four detections. We, we, we use an automatic system. We have an automatic system to probe uh, frequently the end-to-end -end SRV6, the traffic engineering pass uh, to, to, to for, for, for detect the, the, any errors or misconfigurations. Uh, there are very uh, unique uh, requirement in cloud environment is to support the multi-tenant. Uh, we found it's challenge uh, that uh, the, to, to, to accommodate the multi-tenant uh, in, in using the SRV6 VPN because the a different tenant uh, use different uh, may have different uh, SL requirement that may uh, occupy may, may consume huge uh, fee uh, resources. Yeah, uh, we also deployed uh, multiple uh, vendors uh, uh, employ uh, the, the devices from multiple vendors and the interoperability is also 
um, sorry, there are typo here. Interoperability is uh, it's also a challenge. Uh, we, we, we implement SRV6 in Sonic uh, and push it in the community to, to, to uh, provide de facto standards for interop. And uh, the next, next slide. <clears throat> yeah, I just give a very uh, 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 brief introduction of the service-oriented network we, we are going to build. It's, it's, offer, it's going to offer a fine grain network slides for various types of services. Uh, the overall logic is similar to your travel from one place to another place where you can choose different types of transportations. Uh, with, in, in, in this graph, it's a different network slides. Uh, due to the time, to, due to the limited time, I, I will not dive into that. Okay, you can see the slide showcase the physical appearance of the two types of edge routers that you may, uh, we have developed in house. The routers in left is our peering edge router, which is composed of set of simple uh, single chip routers connected in a spin lift configuration for the data plan, where the control plan is located on the three servers at the bottom, at the bottom acting as uh, uh, BTP controllers. And the middle box, uh, sorry. Uh, and the middle box presents a SRV6 based uh, edge service router, uh, ESR, used as a data center peering router. Both of these routers are we are launched at the SEPR, SEPR conference in 2022. Know that the Sony community has been working on the uh, uh, SRV6 and technology for some time, and Alibaba was the first to enable SRV6 VPNs in its edge router and deploy it in its production network. To accelerate its uh, adoption of this technology, Alibaba has decided to upstream uh, the SRV6 VPN changes to the Sonic 2023 uh, release. Cisco also already uh, up screen the necessary SAI support and Alibaba also complete, uh, has completed the SRVC uh, VPN high level design review in the Sonic community and it will be, uh, we'll begin upstreaming the code zone. And as a conclusion, uh, uh, the, let's conclude the status of the uh, SRVC deployment and uh, operation. Uh, the e core we uh, newly built is a DCI network uh, that supports SRV6. And we have a framework uh, uh, utilizing a single protocol stack uh, and, a, and a white box and programmable control plan, the data plan. And we are going to offer fine grain network slicing. That's the, that's the ability we are going to uh, offer for various types of services. And uh, we utilize the DevelOps mode that can simplify network, reduce complexity on demand. Uh, and we also uh, uh, enable uh, SRV6 VPN in edge router in the uh, Sonic communities um, here. And uh, there are challenges we mentioned here is that the, uh, the resources are, 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 the FIB resources are, uh, 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 cons consumed for consumed uh, largely for the requirement for the different uh, different tenants with different SLA uh, requirements, and we also uh, put uh, uh, notice that the visibility is also a challenge here, and uh, we we are noticed that we that interoperability among multiple vendors are need to uh, to pay attention to. And the last uh, uh, part that we, we think that the SRV6 working group is very important and we fully support that. And I hope that it can deliver some document to uh, firstly uh, can deliver test to suit def definition or guidance for needed in the interop test. And, we, and also deliver some uh, best practice and use case uh, and uh, and we also would like to call for more attention participants on the SRV6 development on the Sonic community. Thank you. That's all for my uh, presentation.
Okay, thank you, Lin Jian. Any clarification questions? Sit down. Okay, thank you, Lin Jian. Uh, next uh, present uh, is uh, Tian Ji from uh, China Mobile. Tian Ji? Yeah. Um, maybe you need a yeah, oh, pointer. Okay. Yeah. It'll work. Yeah, okay, please It'll go work. ahead. Okay, it does. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. So, Tianji uh, from China Mobile here. Um, we are going to share some of uh, the challenges, uh, experience that is facing us during the SRV6 deployment and operations. Uh, as the last uh, presenter uh, in this morning, the first hour, uh, is, uh, I have uh, the benefit to inherit, inheriting some uh, knowledge sharing from the, the first presenters, four presenters, and also to uh, synthesize the challenge they are facing. Like uh, in the MTN case, uh, they have uh, the mobile, the, the backhaul part, and the uh, virtualization uh, experience, and the challenge part. Because uh, as the largest uh, mobile operator in the world, uh, in terms of the like uh, subscribers, we are have uh, a deployment uh, experience and the challenges, then some operation issues in that part, and also for the uh, analytics analytics part uh, from the um, Swisscom, and for sure uh, there are a lot of data will be generated in our networks, so it's also something we have to deal with, and for Bell Canada for sure IP uh, uh, SRV six uh, those time the uh, allocation, the planning, the deployment, and also the final operation for sure that is going to apply to our uh, the, the the backbone network and also for the cloud part, for the. Uh, uh, Alibaba, uh, the, uh, the issue they are facing, actually we as the, the company, uh, we are also having lots of a uh, cloud part. We have uh, the uh, CMCC, the China Mobile Cloud. We have the uh, the private network cloud, all kind of things. And then uh, when we run in operating the, the cloud and we have to deploy the technologies, as every six those type of things, we have the uh, we have to deal with the planning part, the uh, deployment part, uh, visualization, analytics, and the final uh, about uh, like uh, the operation things. So when you look at all the things here, you know, uh, in our case, it's like a very big comprehensive network that cross from the wireless to wireline, including cloud, including uh, the, even including some. Um, uh, province uh, network is like uh, to provide enterprise uh, uh, to provide service to enterprise part, and also we have a backbone called the China Mobile Network CMNet. So this is a big picture. In our case, we uh, we are facing a lot of challenges, but we also have a uh, experience and a good practice that can be shared. So uh, yeah, let's. Uh, Go to the next one. That is just uh, is uh, this is agenda. Basically, just uh, you know, I have already used uh, some time to uh, to show. Okay, well, how important and how challenged, uh, uh, how diversified or colorful, all kind of uh, the adjective words to describe our networks as the largest mobile operator. So the first one is just like a China Mobile, a gigantic SRV6 network with with CC deployment. And then uh, for that things, and then I'm uh, I'm going to use the next two uh, bullets to just to show there are two uh, dimensional uh, challenges. One from the horizontal, it just comes uh, comes in like across uh, vendors, the multi vendor interoperability, and then other one is the vertical. It's like a vertical challenge. You can cons consider like the temporal, kind of like uh, in the um, ops. Uh, nomenclature is like the day zero from planning day one deployment and the day two to strive for operational excellency so this is since we are talking about SRV operation so i try to use ops nomenclature to describe the issues we are facing okay here it's just to give a flavor about our network uh, towards the uh, left side is the, the cloud private network it's uh, it's a uh, it's a, a, a SRV6 C uh, state uh, deployed with more than 800 uh, nodes in the the backbone. Backbone is in middle, and then it's uh, it's connected to the province uh, uh, cloud. It's a, a, a cl um, connected to province network. Well, province just uh, considered like the state uh, in America, or maybe the state also here uh, down under uh, in Australia. 
Okay, and then uh, to the right side is the, the same net, is the, the backbone network comes, is com comprised of like more than 10,000 nodes with SRV6 CC deployed. And it's a multi-vendor, multi-AS, unified SDN controller and uh, to distribute end-to-end -end SRV6 CC path. So, you know, consider what I have described at the beginning, at the opening, and also look at these things. You just you can just think we have a very a very large network, very huge, gigantic, and then uh, we have to deal with it from uh, in ops uh, terminology from the day zero planning, day one deployment, and uh, day two uh, operational excellency. Okay, this is the horizontal uh, challenge. Basically, you can consider like uh, like a. Uh, the, uh, the level part, the like uh, uh, spatial part, it's like it's cross the vendor and then cross multi domains. This one, the the, the issue is a more is toward the interoperability. So on the uh, left side, it just uh, show okay some challenges that being uh, faced by us. Here, either to to see yeah, outside here, yeah. yeah. So the challenge is like uh, the the vendor uh, use its uh, you know own proprietary controllers to deploy the brand name devices, and then as uh, for us as the operator, we have to deploy some super controller to manage the versatile device controller across for all the vendors, and then this does uh, increase the deployment complexity and the might result in high failure probability. So on the right side, we just show, okay, what we have done to remedy the challenges here. So it's like, uh, okay, to deploy some uh, fully decoupled single layer controller to handle various types of vendors devices. And then to try to, uh, to provide a unified thoughtbound interface and a unified control protocol for a greatly simplified deployment. This part is on the horizontal challenge across vendor, across domain uh, to achieve interoperability. Yeah, the first uh, for the next uh, three uh, slides is going to I'm going to cover like the vertical challenge uh, in the ops uh, uh, worlds is a day zero, day one, and a day two, uh, using some uh, specific example. But I'm not going to touch the details since in the Bell Canada they have give about similar things like the uh, um, like address allocation, the planning things. But here I just say okay, well that is very uh, important, critical. Well. Another word is challenging. And well, here we have like a, a C seed and the co e coexistence of C seed and the uncompressed uh, seed. But this one does uh, involve a lot of planning work at the very beginning. So this is the day zero challenge. Yeah, the next one after the day zero planning, and then we have to find a very efficient, effective, and reliable way to do the deployment. Yeah, here, this is end to end. In our case, it cross AS, cross vendor, and across, uh, and also uh, across the wireless, wireless and the line. So this is going to have a lot of challenge for the deployment side. Yeah, I'm not going to touch the attack the details here, but uh, you know, uh, later we can share the. I think the slide has been shared already. Yeah, for the uh, for the final things, okay. Uh, after day zero, day one, and then we have to run the network. Basically, we have to strive for operational excellency. There are a lot of ways to do it. Here, just say okay. There was some. Um, this is more like both the proactive and active things, like to failure detect, and then also for proactive, proactive protection. You know, so all the things, the the target is for the operational excellency. I just uh, give uh, give some example and the different the red uh, the star on different place along the network backbone and mesh hole to say okay on the different. Uh, points we may experience problems so we have to use all kind of technologies across across different maybe the different groups from different domains to uh, tackle the issue here okay so in in summary here it's like okay well here since we are talking about our experience our challenge but we our objective is for the operation so so the things like uh, uh, based on the our uh, pro, uh, 
presentation and also the previous four, you can see the, the practice, not just the restrict to us, but also like uh, the, the um, Bell Canada, uh, Swisscom, uh, MTN, Alibaba, and, and etc. I, I'm, I'm sure other operators in the price, uh, OTT comes, companies will face the similar things, like the whole practice will involve inevitably different technologies, SRV6, I think controller, BGP, IEP, VPN, V6, ops, et cetera, you name it. But so far, when we look at across the IETF community, there are no suitable place to handle this type of interoperable and managerial challenges in a, in a holistic way. And like not siloed, but we want to get it in a comprehensive or holistic way. That is why we are here to ask, to request the community to form a working group as a V6 ops to get this one under control. And also for everyone, not just the operator to share the best practice. Thank you. Okay, thank you Tianji. Any clarification questions? Sit down. So uh, maybe through we can begin the chat discussion. I have a, a question for uh, uh, Chinji. I wonder if you can expand it because I have a feeling we have a misconception of when you mention 10,000 node, I, that must be like an island in your network that is 10,000 node, not in total 10,000 nodes, you must have much more than that, is it? If you could clarify that, because we even have some comment in the chat. Okay, but the, uh, the chat part here is like, uh, yeah, which is to show our network is uh, the big here, is uh, uh, the SRV is being deployed, may not be the total 10,000, but it's pretty much close to uh, uh, there already. That is just as the, for the CM net. Yeah. yeah so. That, so uh, yeah, let me give uh, you some clarification. So uh, I think uh, the network TNG mentioned that, that is uh, the IP backbone. So uh, for uh, uh, CM Knight is uh, channel mobile's uh, IP backbone. In that network, we have uh, uh, more than 10,000 uh, core routers. It's not an access router. And uh, we uh, have a uh, such as a mobile backhaul network. In that network, we have about two million routers. That router is uh, such as a pizza box for the mobile backhaul. So here, uh, what we mentioned uh, is a backbone network. In fact, that is a really a huge backbone. Uh, if you know the backbone network, that may be the largest uh, backbone network among uh, the operators. Thank you. Uh, Greg, uh, please make sure it's clarifying questions, but you can ask that now, Greg. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, I thought that we we're a chair discussion, okay. so. Uh, uh, Tom, do you have a clarifying question? No. Okay, perfect, thanks. So good that you guys are queuing up for charter discussion, but let's start that quickly. Thanks. So. Uh, I will not try to take too much time. I know there is interest to actually start the discussion, but just so that we can have a constructive discussion, I'll just quickly show the slide, which is uh, the slides which have our proposed charter, which has the mission statement, uh, which highlights some of the topics which came up today in the various uh, operator discussions as well. The idea of developing best practices, operational guidelines, uh, as well as collaborating with other working groups and and how this uh, proposed working group would actually operate. Uh, the scope, again, uh, giving uh, more details on operational issues and requirements, deployment scenarios, management guidance, uh, etc. And finally, uh, the deliverables, which are very important. Uh, again, uh, highlighting some of the key things uh, about where this could be deployed in various different scenarios, uh, recommendations and guidance for uh, address planning for SRV6 SITs, and various management guidance, et cetera. And finally, of course, this working group needs to uh, cooperate with others, uh, and that has been highlighted. 
and this we need to make sure that it meets uh, the guidance uh, working with Spring, working with V6Ops, working with Sixman on key things which have been highlighted. Uh, one thing which I wanted to uh, cover, which came up in the discussions as well, is to highlight the uh, last statements, SRV6 Ops will not adopt any work until it reach consensus in the spring. So this is to make sure that we do not silo the discussion uh, and S Ops part comes in once the technology is actually being developed. And some of the discussions that were happening on the GitHub and on the mailing list, just wanted to highlight. Uh, one thing which has been discussed before and we want to hear more from this group, uh, is it better to create a separate SRV6 ops group or does this work belongs in spring? The proponents have some answers. I'm sure we will have uh, that discussion as well and how to make sure that there is a very clear boundary between what the SRV6 ops does and other working group. How do we note it down in the charter and how when we run this working group, how do we take care of it? And as well as now we open up for bigger discussions. Uh, when you come to the mic, do keep the BOF question in mind. That's why we are here for, not to have a very generic discussion over SRV6, but whether we need to have an SRV6 BOF and whether the scope deliverables and whether this working group would be able to deliver the outputs that they have highlighted, what the proponents have highlighted. So let's start the discussion, Greg. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, Greg Mirsky, Ericsson. Um, so um, while preparing for this discussion, uh, I went back to read uh, V6 Ops uh, Charter, and that led me to the question that probably to ISG. By approving this BOF, does ISG send the message that IPv6, that SRV6 is not IPv6 network? Warren, would you like to? No, I don't think that that's the message at all. I think the message because is... The second paragraph of V6 Ops uh, Charter says, the IPv6 Operations Working Group, V6 Ops, develops guidelines for the de deployment and operation of new and existing IPv6 networks. So to me, that means that any IPv6 uh, technology network falls nicely under the V6 Ops Charter. Would that be the case? I can give uh, a quick thing. No, I, I, my question to ISG, uh, sorry. Let Warren answer that. Um, I mean, I think it's not uncommon for us to take a working group which covers some set of stuff, realize that there's enough interest in a specific part of it and break it out. So I think that there is something different about SRV6 and Spring, where there's looks like enough people doing it and deploying it that having you know, if we do form a working group, having a place where people are focused on that work. But my question was not really, uh, if I was not clear, my question about relationship between the six ops and the new proposed group, not because with the spring. Spring is, yes, I agree. Spring is uh, more encompassing and includes a CRM POS. But uh, this group is proposed to define deployment guidance and best practices for service six so uh, looking at uh, charter of v6 ops that includes any new ipv6 network for the same uh, outcome and uh, if 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 a service six is ipv6 network then i cannot find what's specific about a service six that cannot be addressed and worked within the six ops group i mean there's a couple of options we could update the v6 ops charter to make it clear that this sort of stuff is better handled here i don't think we want to overload v6 ops with something which feels not quite more niche but more specialized um but i mean i will consider your thing and you know we can have more discussion um i mean it, they're clearly related but i think fairly often we take some set of work and break it out into other working groups to focus on right you could claim all ip stuff should happen under working groups which originally did ip right that feels like at some point you're stretching things a bit far but anyway point uh, taken uh, i think we have v6 ops chair yeah. as well so thank do you, you. Wanna... 
Yeah, if, if I may add a comment. So this is Xi Peng Xiao as the B6 op co-chair, but I'm speaking here as an individual. Um, my view is that B6 op at this moment is not is really doing anything on SRV6. So I would feel a little guilty if I say that just because I may do something in the future, you cannot do it now. I think that this is my first point. Um, my second point is that when you want to promote a technology, you know, for me to promote IPv6, I consider SRV6 more as a application of IPv6 rather than a competition. So, you know, if I want to promote IPv6, I would welcome more application of IPv6, um, which is SRV6 in this case. So to summarize, I would say that my view is that uh, SRV6 op can be a useful ecosystem partner for IPv6 rather than a competition. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, let's go on with the queue, Shusun. Uh, Susan from Huawei uh, Technologies. Uh, from the vendor's view, I can see no harm to have this kind of working working group to discuss the, um, you know, there are a lot of good presentations just now, and there are some operations issues that should be covered in the working group. And I think it's a um, really good try, especially in the um, deployment state of a new solution and uh, the providers can give some contributions in the working group and the vendors can you know, collect the feedback inside the working group. I think it's a good try. Tom? Hi there, Tom Hill from BT. Um, I'm, I, to be honest, I, I'm, I, I was going to echo some of the comments that I think have already been made already. Uh, there is a lot of overlap here with other working groups. Um, one that hasn't been mentioned so far is network management ops. And I think, uh, you know, a heck of a lot of the um, pieces that were raised in some of the presentations here, I think actually realistically can be covered in the generic network management context. I don't think we necessarily need to have a specific SRV6 working group for those concerns. Um, I, I take the point that Greg made about <laughs> this, <laughs> if we did form the working group, it would certainly um, you know, make this very distinct from from IPv6. Um, but uh, the the thing that I think really grinds me, and you know, if the working group is formed, the the charter will really need to focus on ensuring that if there are problems that are raised with SRV6 operational issues, that they are not simply brushed aside. We we do need to be very critical of what's hit, you know, what's going on here. Um, and, you know, ultimately at the end of the day, <laughs> we're network engineers. When we do things wrong, the network breaks, we're universally hated for this. And we definitely don't want to be in those situations at any point. So if we do form the working group, and I'm not sure that there is a, there is a clear rationale for that at this point, but if we do, um, I'd be, be very keen to make sure that we are being as critical as possible to ensure that this is working as well as it possibly can. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. Alvaro? Hi, Alvaro Rotana, Futureware Technologies. I'm also the, uh, not the A spring chair. Um, there are more than we have other opinions. Um, fully agree with what Tom said about being critical of, of the deployment. I'm I have to say I'm very happy to see that there are operators that want to come into the ATF and talk about anything. Um, and especially happy that they want to talk about something that Spring has done, uh, because then it means that uh, the work that we've done there is, is, is useful. Um, however, um, I, I do have uh, some concerns, um, especially related to work. And, and this is not only just related to Spring, but maybe related to other working groups where it was talked before about technology done in IPPM and, and um, I, uh, OPS AWG and other places, where uh, what concerns me is the potential conflict that we may create. 
between recommendations or work that may be done in spring, for example. It was brought up here a couple of times, uh, the compressed SIDS, uh, which again, is great that people are using, but spring is not done with that work. So my expectation as chair is that all of the drafts that come out of spring have at least some operational considerations. And what I would not like to see is that those considerations might be different from the considerations in a different working group. Um, I understand that networks evolve and things may change and that the considerations may be different after the work is done. And that's perfectly fine. But you know, just to highlight a couple of things, um, uh, the charter um, talked about uh, looking at work after spring is done. I think that probably needs to be extended to IPPM and other things, right? Um, and and uh, you know, CSIDS is, is one thing that comes to mind, security. Uh, which is important in, all, in every network, of course, uh, because Spring is working on a specific work. Um, you haven't said all that, I think there's, there's, we are gonna need, regardless of whatever the charter says, we're gonna need a lot of coordination between a group like this and the groups that are working on technology that's gonna feed um, the operations, or that may result in enhancements because of issues or other things that might be found uh, in the network. And um, you know, that's not my job, but you know, I'll leave it up to the AESG to figure out how to do that. Uh, overlapping chairs, overlapping ADs, put everything in spring, you know, whatever the, the solution is. Um, uh, we need to, to think about that and think not only about what the charter says, but how this will be operational um, going forward. Thanks. Yeah, just a reminder, please help the note taker with, the, with whatever comments that you're making, making sure it's captured correctly. Next. Uh, Warren, did you want to say something? I was not sure. OK. Uh, Andrew, go ahead. Hi, Andrew. Um, speaking entirely in my individual capacity, I want to echo some of what has been said about overlap. And I've been taking numerous notes during this box. There was reference to PCE in the first presentation. PCE work, we don't have an operational working group for it, and it's always functions, and PCE is covered by draft IETF, PCE, PCEP extension, PCE controller, SRV6, and explicitly assigned by the Spring Charter to PCE. BFD is covered in Spring by another document. TILFA is explicitly assigned to RTGWG by the Spring Charter. IPPPM covers OAM stuff as well. Furthermore, the Spring Charter explicitly places OAM for SRV6 and all things segment routing under Spring. And therefore, I would say that before we proceed with this, we have to recharter Spring simultaneously. Otherwise, we are creating a further forum for working group shopping, which we have seen enough of in the IETF. Those are my thoughts. Yeah, uh, Andrew, very good uh, comments. I think, yeah, th there's work to be done in this space. We need to make sure not just our charter, but what impacts other working group. V6 has been, V6 ops has been highlighted and you have highlighted spring. So yeah, good comments. Thanks. Next, Daniel. Okay, uh, Daniel Huang, CTE. Um, from a um, point of view of a vendor, um, actually we've been always quite thirsty for the uh, operation uh, use cases and requirements to, from the operators. Um, uh, the presentations from from the operators this morning are very impressive and uh, insightful for me. And uh, so um, I believe um, it's quite reasonable to have a focused standard platform in IETF to, to do this job. Thank you. Cheng. Hello, Cheng Li from Huawei. So first of all, I have to thank all the speakers to share the wonderful experience of deploying SRV6. And you know, as a, a vendor, I support all the projects around the world. I see a lot of pro operator they are going to deploy SRV6 in Asia, uh, North America, South America, uh, Africa, Mid East, Europe, yeah, around the world, lots of projects. They are facing a similar problems and you know considerations yep so i do see the value that we should 
like generate some dividables right in ITF. But the question is how and like how can we generate the the the, the you know uh, RFCs as soon as possible because they need it immediately, right? So the key question is which parts that we should take. Like for a vendor, I would support all the operators. So that means I hoped the uh, standards should be uh, you know published as soon as possible. So for me, I think let's create a dedicated working group for the SRV6 operation. That would be the best way for us. At least uh, even uh, like, like, unless uh, you want to delay something, but I don't really think we should do, do so because let's build a better internet together. Thank you. Run. Hello, Parent from Chang Yun Kam. Yeah, we have de uh, widely deployed SRA6 in our network. So I think it will be helpful that if we can form a specific uh, working group uh, dedicated to uh, SRA6 network management uh, guidance, including the observability and the troubleshooting. So I think it will be useful and helpful if um, for new SRA6 solutions deployed. Uh, so I support. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. Eric? So, Eric Vink, uh, <clears throat> first as an individual contributor, I am attending V6 Ops and all the IPv6 working group meeting. I would sincerely not look forward with a big smile having a four or two V6 Ops session, one which is dedicated to pure IPv6, like we do in enterprise, which is the current content of V6 Ops mostly, and one about the v 6 <clears throat> different uh, participants. Having said this, now, as an IAG member, not in charge of this working group, and most probably never, um, if you can go back, Drift, to the slide 12, sure. on the scope, yeah, this last line, when it will come in front of the ISG, means, I mean, I don't understand it, I cannot pass it, so please change it before sending it to, perhaps, to the ISG for creating the working group. Is there anything specific you want to point to us? But I don't know what it means. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know the verb, right? I mean, yeah. reach consensus of what, right? How can SRV6 Ops can adopt something with a consensus in spring? Mm -hmm. Because then it may mean the charter will be overlapping. Yeah. And it would be wrong, right? Yeah. So uh, mostly I can understand what you mean there, but Correct. could so be clear. I, I think this is on the working group proponents. We need to discuss more and get more feedback from uh, like other uh, folks who have done this chartering before and especially pick the right words. Sometimes like our intentions is right, but we are not using the right words there. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's, that's mainly a wording issue. Yeah. Uh, Rob, please. So uh, I'd like to say thank you for everyone who's presented. Um, I think it's really good for operators to come here to the ITF. I think it's a great thing. And uh, I think in the past we've had more separation or a few operators in here and i think the fact you are a set of operators with a common interest who want to try and solve things in the itf i think we should try and encourage that so um when i was an ad before i stepped down one of the last things i did was create the nmop working group and again that working group was chartered to be more operator led in terms of bringing requirements in and focusing on a few topics uh, again, that the operators are choosing to do with uh, operations relate, related to network management. And I agree to a company who said it, there is some overlap potentially with what this working groups um, would be charged to do, I imagine, but I still think that that's solvable. I think you can find a clear split between the two. And I'm not, again, it's not out, out of my remit, but I'm not so keen with NMOP being extended to cover a lot of this stuff. I think that that would give it a very sort of split brain in terms of personality and what it's trying to do. Um, I think some of the questions in terms of the um, BOF proposal, is enough people to work on it here? I think that's a question back to the proponents. I mean, it feels like there's quite a lot of people working on SRV6, uh, interested in operations here that are coming to this place. So I think, yes, I think to me, there's enough people here. I don't know whether there's wider deployment and discussions in Nanog would be the alternative. So I think this is a good place to do it. I also think it's a good thing to try. So um, one last comment I would say is, these things aren't set in stone, these working groups. They can be created, charters can be changed, they can they can be tried for a couple of years and they're not working, tweak them, close them, change them. So, so I'm in favor of, of trying to do something here. I think there's work on the charter to figure out exactly what, but um, I, would, I, would, I would encourage it, basically. Thank you. Robin? Uh, Robin from Huawei. 
uh, so that's the I, I think that is good to see so many operators to hear to talk about this the operation issues. I think that in the past years, I think in the spring working group or in the RTD areas, and uh, much of these uh, protocols and solutions has been proposed by the vendors and also trigger much debate about such uh, solutions. Uh, but uh, after several years' work, I think uh, the SRV6 has been deployed or now is being adopted by some operators. I think uh, we have a good platform to talk about this, the operation issues or identify the possible the interoperability issues. I think this will be helpful for our to improve our this the solutions and to refine our products. I think this will be helpful and constructive. So I would like to say that we have a good platform for the operators to share the experience about this the SRV6 operation. Thanks. Okay. Uh, yeah, Jim Kishaw from Futureway. Uh, I'm speaking with my uh, routing AD hat on and uh, the AD responsible for Spring. Um, so first of all, I've I got quite a few thoughts in my head that I'm still trying to process. And um, But the first one is to thank everybody for the presentations today. And um, I guess it, to some degree, puts to bed the argument that no one's deploying SRV6. So thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. Um, so it's night comment gone. Um, I think um, what I haven't heard from anybody so far is them saying this work isn't necessary. Um, I think what's been proven today um, from the BOF, which is the biggest thing I've got out of it, is that there is clearly a community of interest for this work. And most of the argument is, well, where does this work actually get done? Does it get done in its own working group? Do we need to do it in an existing uh, V6 Ops group or some other working groups in the IETF? Um, I think those are all details that we can work out afterwards. But um, you know, one option that went through my mind was if this working group is formed, then there's nothing to stop us from folding it into somewhere like V6 Ops after the initial milestones have been completed that are considered to be critical milestones from an SRV6 perspective by the uh, community. So ju just my initial thoughts. Yeah, Adrian? Uh, hi. Um, so yeah, the usual thanks to the operators for coming forward and, uh, and, and risking themselves in front of the, uh, the audience. Uh, it's very much appreciated. I think on this slide, the middle bullet uh, deliverables has uh, some issues. And it's not that the charter text does not clearly show what deliverables are intended. It's that the charter text does not clearly show what deliverables are not intended. Uh, I believe it would be really helpful to call out explicitly that the working group is not doing protocol work. Um, I don't see any protocol work listed in the charter text as it is, but I read from the presentations today that the operators are looking to work on things, whether that's IPv6 or um, some additional protocol PM work or Yang models. and. I would like it to be very clear whether that is in or out of scope of this charter. I believe it should be out of scope. Yes. Thanks. Uh, I think they do mention that they will not work on any standard track document, but I think we can make it more explicit. So yeah, good comments. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, so if, if that is intended, I just read the charter text linked to from the BOF page. I read it several times and I don't see that statement. Uh, can somebody put the link? Okay, we just yeah, I, I think that's why Thanks, Adrian. But let's continue. Dan? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. So uh, maybe I, I will be a little bit biased as I uh, presented myself uh, a couple minutes ago uh, that I am favoring this working group, but um as 
sitting in different other working group like BESS or uh, Spring uh, or LSR. Uh, in these working and from leading myself some, some draft like SR application and so on, we don't really have like uh, a clear a voice uh, to express use cases and challenges. Usually when, when, when I'm on stage, say on, on Spring, it's to uh, explain the technology that we're creating when we are on the uh, Spring uh, hat in this case, or in PC or, or in, uh, in, in DES uh, as well. So here, I think it's, it's quite obvious almost to echo some of the comment that uh, if there's a forum for operators where Obviously, we're not on the operator hat creating new technology at all. We're just uh, uh, to make it clear some of the use case, some of the challenges to express real life uh, a scenario or where we're, we're coming from. So sometimes it turns out to be best practices. Some other time it's, uh, well, we have a problem there and this is what we're doing uh, right now. If we had this uh, other technology pointing to other working group, uh, that are in development, that maybe we will be able to alleviate those uh, those challenges. So, uh, and maybe if it leads that we we look at other working group charter, then why not? I mean, here is really to talk about problem challenges, real life deployment, uh, explaining how we're using the technology. I think it's very good for operators to operators, but also as uh, some. I think Robin from, from what we pointed out in Chanli that it's also very valid for uh, different uh, uh, vendors that we clearly have our stage to express these things. So uh, in this context, I'm pretty much in favor for that. Thanks. You saw, and please keep it uh, concise, your comments. Thank you. Okay. I'm Isun Liu from China Mobile. Uh, uh, at TNT, have a uh, president. Uh, we have uh, deployed the SRA six in our uh, uh, cloud private network and the same night. Uh, but uh, during the process, we have uh, faced uh, many challenges, like uh, how to uh, 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 plan the SRA six address on uh, based on the existing uh, IPv six address planning, and uh, how to uh, uh, choose the, the the solution for the inter AS with or without the bonding seed. And also for the uh, protection solutions, uh, like how to coordination of the uh, uh, E2E protection and the local protection. So uh, I know, I know, uh, in ITI uh, like the Spring ITJSWG and other working groups have uh, have uh, uh, provide, uh, provided many uh, technology technologies. But uh, as an operator, uh, we hope uh, to. Uh, have have some places to share sharing the the experience and we can uh, uh deploy these uh technologies uh, uh better to uh, uh to deploy that uh, in in our uh, network and thank you thanks Cheng. yeah Cheng again like first of all i think uh, we, we do have a like strong support of uh, uh you know the need right because we see uh, the community we all have the interest in, in doing that that and we also see the scope is clear so uh, let's focus on the three questions and the de uh, deliverables well uh, as agent said we, we may need to do some modification but indeed for me it's clear and so come back to the question how can we address this you know problem right making it as an additional uh, load in the existing now uh, working groups or let's try to create a parallel working group in the same time because uh, from my personal experience it's really hard to get a you know presentation in spring or six man or v6 ops because there are lots of you know lots of works there right we only have two hours per meeting for a session and you ha cannot get a 10 minutes of presentation it's really hard right everyone is overloaded we even need like six chairs for spring working group so why not just Make a new working group, then we can do things in parallel, right? Okay, uh, that would be a perfect yeah, choice. Yeah. Thanks. Let's keep keep it moving. Chong Feng. Okay, uh, Chong Feng from China Telecom. 
Uh, firstly, I think that this work is useful, so I support to have such a, a working group. A working group, however, I think that the name should be reconsidered because, uh, as of from the perspective of technology, uh, SRV six is a part of IPv six. So we cannot have a working group that has a same place to, uh, to to IP, to v six to v six ops. Uh, otherwise, it will be misleading to the industry. Um, it may think that IPv6 uh, is SRV6 is parallel to IPv6. I think it's not right. Uh, this is my second point. The third point is that um, uh, consider that the, currently the network is very uh, fragile. Uh, a misleading, um, mis small misconfiguration can make the network outage, not a widespread outage. So uh, SRV6 makes the network complex. Uh, that is fact. So the, one expectation to this work is that uh, how to uh, make the network more code reliable, how to make uh, it more secure when SRV6 is introduced. That's my point. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Lin Jian? Oh, I muted yeah. myself. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, as I mentioned in my slides, uh, I, I support this working group. I think it's a uh, focus one on the SRV6 deployment and how to run this network, and especially uh, as the operators and also Alibaba Cloud is a, can contribute to this working group on our DevOps experience. Especially, we have a, a lot of experience in how to implement the SRV6 into the real running uh, code and the devices that are running uh, the, the network. So I think uh, uh, we, we are the operators and contributors. I think uh, we also would like to more uh, contributor operator to hear uh, what challenges or what, how they deal with the problems we are facing uh, on, on the stage we are uh, deploy and operate the network. So that's the... Uh, yeah, that's my idea to 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 support the, the the working group. Yeah, thanks, Greg. Um, I'm Greg Mirsky Erickson. Um, so maybe it's my impression, but um, the arguments for this group uh, I hear is that oh, we cannot do it in the spring. Um, yeah, I agree. Spring probably not the right place. And then the argument is say oh. Other groups are too busy. Um, as I understand and as I observed over years, um, V6 ops uh, usually uh, run, uh, uses the same slot with the ops area uh, working group. So would it be that difficult uh, to request uh, a longer slot and separate slot to accommodate uh, their uh, SRV6 discussions in V6 ops group? Uh, we close the queue, but we, we actually have three minutes. So let's just quickly give uh, the last three folks. And after this, we really close the queue. So, Shusun. <laughs> uh, Shusun from tech, uh, Huawei Technologies. Uh, actually, I think there are some a lot of comments from the chat box. I noticed that people really confused with the scope and how it can be done without protocol extensions. Uh, while well, I think, for example, the, the dance uh, presentation gave really good example about how to do this. We can solve the problem without protocol extensions, for example, SRV6 seed allocation. And I think it's also mentioned in uh, Thomas' presentation, for example, the prefix uh, visualization. I think there is no protocol extension, but it's a real implementation problem that could be solved in this new working group. Yeah, so I just want to respond, Jim Kishar from Futureway, and uh, responding to Greg actually specifically and um, on, on one comment, but I have a, a two comments, give him a little bit more time to think. Um, so um, one of the things that I think we uh, that we really need to clarify is the deliverables. Um, and, you know, for example, it may be that this group is formed um, and they actually don't, uh, the deliverable isn't documents. You know, it's just a place to get together to discuss these things and then move the work uh, wherever it needs to go. So that's something we should consider. The other thing that I think we could consider, um, although I'm not offering it at this point, but we could consider it, is that we um, extend 
um, spring into two sessions. Um, one session specifically focused on doing protocol work and another session specifically focused on the things that we're looking at here. So that's something that Warren and I have been talking about and, and we'll continue to have that conversation. But I just wanted to bring that up, Greg, because I think that partially covers your uh, your comment. Yeah, Jim kind of stole my thunder. It's going to be like, we should have this for his two sessions. Um, I, no, no, all good. I'll also point out there is also the MOPS working group, which is media operations, and it provides a venue for people to get together and discuss things. It's not really a like, working group focused on publishing documents, but more a place for people to just kind of get together, share their learnings. Oh, God, I said learnings. Um, share what they've learned and you know discuss things. So that might be an idea too. But yeah, I think there's also we should consider putting the work on measurement stuff in measurement places or, you know, V6 stuff in V6 ops, et cetera. I'm sorry, actually, uh, measurement already have a IPPM working group. Uh, yes, the, as a summary here, it's like uh, we very quickly, if you have to say. Okay, well, uh, nothing more seems like uh, the tradition today, like for presenter to talk about the positive oh, oh, comments oh, oh, oh. again. Okay, but uh, I will just uh, break the convention today. I will not say anything about it, but uh, we do uh, propose to form a group. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, Thomas? Good. <clears throat> so we come now to the, the next step with the, with the both questions. Uh, we prepared a total of six questions, and we are starting with the first one. And yeah, for the ones uh, who have not been yet logged in, logged into Miteco, uh, please scan the QR code. And be ready to use the poll tool. Uh, this question uh, is only for the operators, please. So other folks, you can click on no op opinion and we would like the vendors to, uh, uh, operators to answer this question. You can answer. Uh, sorry, say again. I didn't hear you. So this is only for the operators. Increasing. Let's give it a second. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so let's move on to the next question. So here again, this question is on only for the operators. Are the operators here that are planning or evaluating SRV6 deployment in their networks? Good. Might I uh, make the note that there are a lot of separate operators in here, seemingly. Um, I, I would question the validity of doing this in, in, in this particular way, because we have probably a lot of people that work for the same company that are all saying yes. Of course, and of course we have the, the attendee list and other things to look at. This is just one of the factors that we wanted to look at. Thank you, but thanks for your input. So. Let's move on to the next question. This is now for uh, everybody, please. Uh, is there interest and focus in the subject matter presented today to warrant the formation of a working group? So that question is for everyone. Okay. 
good. So, yeah, let's move on to the next question. Here again, that would be for everybody who would be willing to contribute drafts, operational presentations, or, or other items. Um, if I may clarify a question, is it conditional to forming working group or unconditional? <laughs> <laughs> because the question is ambiguous then. No tick. Good. Then let's move on to the next question. Also here for everybody, who would be willing to review drafts? Just FIR, I've never seen this many people ever review a draft, so. <laughs> so let's move on to the last and final question. Is there support to form a working group with the proposed charter, assuming any charter revision will be discussed and made? This is for everybody again. Uh, those who clicked no, would you like to come and tell us and give us uh, some feedback on that, that we can take it to heart. So please use this opportunity to queue up again in the mic, especially for the people who's, who say no and want to give their reasons as well. Thank you. So let, let's keep the, this running, but Andrew, go ahead. Yeah, I firmly believe that there is too much overlap. And if we are going to make continuous claims that SRV6 is IPv6, it should be treated as IPv6 under the guise of the IPv6 working groups. Otherwise, we should make an explicit acknowledgement that SRV6 is not IPv6. And once that acknowledgement has been meet, made, we can then revisit Thanks, Andrew. Greg? Yes, um, actually, I, I second uh, what Andrew said is that was my uh, first question to ISG that by approving uh, this uh, buff, ISG hinted that it sees a service 6 as not IPv6 network. So I believe that either what Jim proposed as extending and dedicating separate session uh, under spring or and under their uh, V6 ops. So that I think that it's a reasonable uh, place uh, to have these discussions and uh, keep working. Thanks, Greg. Tom? Yes, I, I think I voted no for two reasons. Tom Hill from BT, sorry. Um, I'm not, I, I think, I, you know, I still I haven't been convinced uh, against my my skepticism earlier, um, so we don't need to go over that again. Um, the other problem that I had with the with the question, in, in so much as any any adjustments to the charter discussed and made, how can you commit to doing that at this point? Uh, because like that's how we do, boss. We propose the charter at this moment of time. Sure. Of course, this is going to be changed. We will continue to work on our mailing list, and finally, enough time would be given to the mailing list as well as in the various reviews to give feedback. But this is just as one input 
that we can provide as BOF chairs to the ISG what we saw in this room at this moment of time. Nothing more than that. It's not binding in any way. That's the usual process. And if Warren, if you want to answer to that as well, you, and if I made a mistake in saying something, please correct me. Yeah, I mean, I think it's not, you know, would you be willing to commit to this exact charter? But do you think this is generally kind of heading in the right direction? Obviously, like if people completely rewrite the charter, your view would change. But, you know, is this generally kind of mostly okay-ish kind of sort of? I suppose then I would, I would, if the chairs could furnish us with the information of the revisions that you're proposing to discuss, sure. um, as collected from this meeting, that would be helpful yeah. for us to have here now. I understand, but looking at the time, I'll go focus on uh, hearing uh, the people who have already queued up. Uh, Matthew? I drove, so, sorry, I, I kind of had the same comment as Tom there. I wasn't sure what I was really expressing an opinion on you see quite often you'll you'll sort of ask is this charter a good basis to form the working group not it's it's the it's the caveat at the bottom that confused the heck out of me and i don't know what i'm what i'm signing up for okay thanks but, so. Ketan? uh thank you Ketan Talaulikar, cisco uh i i think uh, all Protocol working groups are in the routing area do have we do have operational considerations in the documents, but there is not sufficient meat in those sections. And from what I heard today, there is definitely a need uh, for informational use case uh, BCP documents to be developed. And I think this challenge or issue is not specific to Spring or SRV6. It's a more general thing. Uh, I don't have a solution how to do that, uh, but uh, I'm really uh, happy to hear the operator's input here, and we should try to find out a solution for that uh, uh, across the board in the routing area, I would think. Thank you. Jeff? Uh, Jeff, thanks for NVIDIA. So I'm kind of torn here. On one side, I love to see people talking about how to deploy stuff. If it would have happened to all ATF technologies, you would have had much better protocols by now, right? I'm not sure we really need a separate space for that. The fact that we cannot do it in Spring or someplace else is unhealthy, right? Uh, so my point here is if operators need special working group in order to tell what they're doing, there's something fundamentally broken in ATF. Practically, I, I, I love to see people talking about the technology. It's educational, it's useful. I mean, when we publish 7938, which is BGP and large GC, there are people who sleep with the RFC, right? They deploy their network according to this, it works, it's tested. So I very much support the effort of providing more data. I'm not sure that creating more bureaucracy, which it is. The Spring is kind of center of the web of PCs, uh, BGPs, ISSs and so forth to bring it all together. So we're kind of creating separate universe here that, you know, it creates much more complexity in bureaucracy. I'm not sure it's positive, but if this is what operators need to express their experience, maybe it's a good thing. Thanks. Uh, I stopped the queue, but proponents, anybody wants to say something? Otherwise, I'll give the last word to our AD. I just uh, uh, try to share some experience here. The since operator, well, in some other organization as deals, they have both the, uh, the force to push technology and also uh, push for the operation. So the in the ITF, really hope the ITF community give us opportunity to push both the technology and operation. Thank you. So, you know, I'll need some more time to try and figure out a lot of my thoughts. But a couple of things that have resonated with me most recently, Jeff Tansura's whole like, you know, if operators need a place that they can't go in their actual working group, that's evidence of a problem. And I think maybe it kind of is. Um, maybe what we need for this is some way that people can have much more operational type discussions in a lot of the existing working groups, possibly spring being one of them. So maybe like, you know, a spring session focused on the operational part, maybe with 
somehow different chairs who swap in with more of a like focus on stuff, you know, more of a focus way. But I think that that's true in many places in the IETF. So sort of structural problem, we'll need to go and discuss things and think about things. You know, maybe we also just have sort of a forum for people to discuss things, um, use cases, that sort of thing, I think is really useful to share. And many existing working groups are sort of hostile to that. So it's kind of a cultural place and a safe place to have discussions, I think is what we need. Not strictly this working group, that group, mean a cultural change. If wow, I, it wasn't clear and I rambled. If I may, I would say that the argument that if we have a separate uh, SRV6 ops group, then SRV6 is not part of uh, IPv6 is very inconvincing because by this argument, then anything related to IPv6 should have been done in six main and V6 ops. So why did we define SRV6 in spring working group? Thank you. Uh, nobody's jumping. Yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, we have a lot of inputs, good discussions, and things to think about. We'll come back to the group with the meeting minutes as well as if so please check the notes uh, for especially your comments and we will give our final we'll discuss among the chairs and give our understanding of what we heard in the room thank you thanks for a very successful discussion at this point thank you